All right. I think that we are on the internet. Hello, internet. Uh, <clears throat> thank you all for joining. We are going to um, take some time, let everybody log in. We're going to just putz around here for a few minutes. We'll get going right at the top of the hour with our content from today's discussion about uh, distribution uniformity and sprinkler efficiency. But until then, I want to introduce some of my friends who joined me for the conversation today, starting with Mr. Arizona himself, Doug Donahue. Hi, Doug. Good morning. How are things in Arizona today? Uh, hotter than stink. Really? So yeah. In, in Denver, we have had nothing but rain, so much so that here it is, the end of June, and I haven't even turned on my irrigation system except for on my gardens yet. That's How what are things I hear. down there? Oh, we have a, a lot of job security right now in the irrigation uh, business. I think it's going to be about 110 today. Ooh, yikes. Yeah. <laughs> so you're catching the few minutes of the day that it's tolerable to even be outside, huh? That's right. <laughs> nice. Uh, with us, we have my friend Corey Fitch, who is uh, a field expert from the Denver Public Schools. Corey, how's it going? Good. How are you this morning? I'm doing well. Uh, and Corey is a great irrigation guy. Corey, um, when I was I was Facebook stalking you uh, to develop content, and I noticed you have a whole string of certifications that go along with your name. Can you tell me what uh, certification, what irrigation certifications you carry? Sure, I am uh, Weather Track certified. I am a CIT irrigation um, technician certified with the Irrigation Association, and I am both ASSE and USC 10th Edition Backflow um, testing certified. Nice. nice. And a lot of times on this show, we uh, tout the value of the training that the IA provides. Um, can you just give us a little, mm -hmm. your take on the, the time you've spent training with the IA? Yeah, it's it's very helpful. It's very uh, useful, and there's a lot of knowledge to be gained from it. And you know the C the CEUs or the CECs, the continuing education credits that they want you to take. Um, just make sure you stay up to date and current, and even with uh, new technologies. Yeah, absolutely. That's why I do what I do for sure. Is just to help people save water by using the technology to its greatest advantage. Uh, and Doug Donahue, you and I see each other kind of, I, I joke, on the lecture circuit a lot, right? Right. <laughs> we end up talking at the same to sorts of events. Um, have you taken any IA certification classes? Uh, yes, I'm a certified landscape irrigation auditor. I first became one in 1996. Uh, actually, it was earlier than that. And then I let it lapse for a while. And when I started at Ewing about 13 years ago, I went through the program again. And, and uh, so I am a certified landscape irrigation auditor through the IA. And I use that information every single day with what I do in my job. And if you were to talk to the water nerds out there, what would you tell them about getting certified through the IA? Oh, I would uh, recommend it very highly. Um, there is a uh, publication that you can buy, and if you can't find a class to go through, you can self-study uh, the material. And then there's, uh, wherever you live, there's lots of testing centers uh, available where you can just go and take the test online. And, uh, and if you pass it, you're a certified landscape irrigation auditor. Yeah, and they really get into the nooks and crannies of all of this irrigation nerd stuff. So uh, talking about a lot of the terms that we'll throw around today, right? Uh, we're going to yeah. drill into some very specifics today uh, and the, to understand not only what we're talking about, but then the whole picture, how this fits into the equation, uh, a, a solid foundation of irrigation knowledge uh, only helps that conversation. So sure. that's why you guys are both here. I know that that lives. You're both field smart and book smart. Uh, Doug Donahue also happens to be an expert at finding the perfect margarita. Right, <laughs> Doug Donahue? 
Well, it's a lifelong quest, and so I'm still working on it, but I've, I've got it narrowed down pretty good right now. And it seems like to me, in my Facebook stalking world, uh, actually, I, I tuned in for you on LinkedIn instead of Facebook, um, <clears throat> but I was Facebooking Corey, and it seems like Corey has a fair share of expertise in the Mexican food world. Corey? Uh... Do you have family that runs that Mexican food joint? They are not family. I mean, biological, but they are adopted family. Yes. Because, <laughs> man, I was hungry just looking at those pictures. <laughs> yeah. The mocajete bowl is amazing. Ah, mocajete. It's Spanish for way too much meat, I think. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, um, fellas, we are coming up on the top of the hour. Um, but one last thing I wanted to to pick your brain about. Um, Corey, I am a big fan of the IA and the Smart Irrigation Month uh, that is coming up in the month of July. We are right on the precipice of Smart Irrigation Month, sponsored by HydroPoint. Uh, and I am wondering... Have you ever been to the IA show? Have you ever spent time going to the walking the floor there? I have not. Okay. So that I is... haven't missed it in 12 consecutive shows, except for the one that was COVID affected. Uh, Doug Donahue, how about you? Do you beat my record? Uh, no, I can't beat your record. Typically, uh, with the position that I have, I only get to attend when it's in uh, Phoenix. Uh, however, I understand I'm going to be attending uh, the IA show in San Antonio this year. If you've uh, not been to San Antonio, uh, Corey, hint, hint, uh, it's one of my favorite places with the ambiance of their uh, river walk uh, that they've got there. Uh, they've got the convention centers at one end of the river walk and a lot of the hotels are scattered along the way. So uh, it's, it's really cool to be able to take that river walk uh, to get to the convention center every day and lots of great places to eat and lots of entertainment down there. And there's this one stairway. If you go up this one stairway, you're at the Alamo. Whoa, really? Yeah. So how cool is that? I didn't so, know that part. So I recommend it very highly uh, and I will be there this year. And Corey, I found a great flight from DIA down to San Antonio. So if you want the hookup, you just let me know. I definitely go. would like to go. I've been to San Antonio. Uh, my wife took me there for my birthday, one of our first trips together. And uh, I watched this lady run into a dip and dot cart on a, um, what do they call those that the mall cop drives? The, um, the, the little gyroscope things. The <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. She couldn't figure out how to stop and she ran right into smack dab into the food cart. <laughs> Oh no! <laughs> Dipping dots. That was everywhere. memory maker. <laughs> All Pretty right. Funny. Uh, well, I uh, need a uh, love as much as I love a good dip and dot story. I need to jump in here and get going with our official content. So, give me two seconds to share my screen. Oh, today we will be discussing irrigation efficiency. I think we are ready to go. So, yep, top of the hour. So thank you for staying with us through the pre-show. It is time to get started with Smart Water Wednesdays. Welcome to all of my irrigation and water nerds. My name is Ben Coffey. I'll be your host for today. Um, and today we are talking about the important subject of irrigation efficiency. Uh, <clears throat> And with me, I have my friend, Doug Donahue. Oh, Doug, slide, get there. Doug is a 45-year industry vet. Doug is a fantastic irrigation trainer who I always have the pleasure of uh, seeing at some events that we go to together. And I always sit in his classes and learn a little bit. Uh, Doug Donahue, thank you for making time this morning. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you for having me, Ben. It is certainly my pleasure to have you. Quite an honor. And my friend Corey Fitch, who is, oh, let me get to his slide. Corey Fitch, 
on LinkedIn, you look so professional. Like I had to look twice to even make sure that this was you. <laughs> I'm used to you in the dirty t-shirts with the, the shovel on your shoulder. Uh, so um, Corey is with the Denver Public Schools. So right here in my very own backyard, a local success story. And um, Corey is awesome because I was Facebook friends with Corey and we were part of all of these irrigation forums uh, mm -hmm. long before I really put together that he was a tech on one of my accounts that I was managing here locally because I uh, we just hadn't crossed paths that much. Um, so Corey, thank you for making time this morning. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. It, it certainly is. Uh, and Corey, I want you to take one second and talk about uh, your involvement in the social media crowd. Like we are both part of the social groups on Facebook with that knuckle dragon jumpsuit guy and the ear gate or the sprinkler dude and shout out to yeah. all the guys who manage those sites. Um, tell me how you got involved with all that. Um, I don't remember how I became involved i think i was just searching irrigation pages because i'm always interested in learning a little bit more and no no matter how long we've been in the industry things are always changing newer new technologies coming out there's always something to learn from somebody and so it's nice to see how people do certain repairs what they talk about um and just Listen, I think sometimes we can just learn a little bit by listening. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, I think of it as continuing education, right? I I learn from the books for sure, but then seeing the field perspective and seeing what the guys are going through and the struggles that they have and the bumps in the road and how they solve them, uh, it, it offers context to what we do in the books, right? And so yeah. I think that it's super valuable and I love being part of it. Um, so shout out to those guys who are doing a great job. All right. So here we go. Today, we want to talk about sprinkler, or sprinkler efficiency. This came from a conversation that I had with Corey. Corey is uh, very adamant about um, <clears throat> having a sound irrigation system to support his smart controller. Um, and oftentimes in the weather track world, we don't choose to go down this alley. Right. We talk about the advantage that the smart controller brings and don't spend time talking about the advantage that field efficiency can bring uh, and and how important it is. If you really do want to walk the walk of water management, that we make sure that the field components are sound and the design is sound and the distribution is sound uh, on top of things like scheduling and flow monitoring that the smart controller can bring. So we want to spend time today really drilling down on that super nerdy, uh, what one setting, right? In weather track terms, we are talking about this sprinkler efficiency. Um, and this really, when I'm doing the training thing, I talk about how this reflects not only the design and install, but really the long-term maintenance of these systems and what we get in the field in terms of uh, the hardware that is actually delivering the water. And that's what we're gonna kind of go into today. So first I wanna start talking about uh, the most common question that I get when I'm doing this spiel is, is that efficiency setting your distribution uniformity uh, or your DU? That's something that we, talk about in those irrigation classes a lot. Um, and the answer is not exactly. <laughs> so first let's talk about what distribution uniformity is. And for this, I am going to uh, hand the microphone over to Doug Donahue because I know he has an answer right off the top of his head. Doug, okay. can you explain distribution uniformity for me? Uh, I'll give it I'll give it a shot here. Um, <clears throat> So when you look in the manufacturer's catalog, there's a lot of uh, great information in the performance charts about uh, sprinkler equipment. 
So Corey, for example, if you were looking at the performance chart for a Rainbird 15 foot half nozzle, spray head nozzle, you would be able to see what the uh, ideal operating pressure is, the operating range, how far it's gonna spray, uh, how many gallons a minute it uses and what the precipitation rate is. But nowhere in there will you find what the distribution uniformity is. And that's because that is uh, site specific. The only way we can calculate the distribution uniformity is to uh, conduct an irrigation audit. Now we have some general uh, guidelines for what distribution uniformities are. We might say spray heads are typically about 40% uh, distribution uniformity. Uh, rotors are about 70% distribution uniformity or DU and uh, high efficiency spray head nozzles are also somewhere in the 70% range. But again, the only way that we can actually figure that out is to set up our little catchments. And uh, we run the sprinklers for a certain amount of time and we do some fairly simple math. And in a fairly short period of time, we have the distribution uniformity or the DU for that specific system. That gives us a lot of great information that we can use to uh, know how to best program the control. And uh, Corey, I'm going to bounce this to you as well, because this is really when you and I sat down and talked, the, the conversation that inspired uh, this whole topic for me um, really was driven in a design that you were looking at. Can you tell me your experience on how you get involved with uh, implementing good distribution uniformity for Denver and what you see uh, kind of from the from the installation point of view? Yeah, so I have a couple sites that are being redone, and um, I've I've asked to um, to see and review the irrigation plans for these sites, and um, you know, in in an industry that speaks and preaches water conservation, um, this one particular design just didn't speak water conservation to me at all. So I asked for it to be redone and i understand that there's multiple ways to achieve match precipitation but to me match precipitation is the most important part of the irrigation system design um you'll always get a du rate no matter what the design is or what heads are in there but to get the best du rate i believe we achieve that through having proper match precipitation and i've always been made fun of for driving home the point of the importance of match precipitation I'm not making fun. I just bring it up. <laughs> well, I have a I have a friend who's a certified irrigation auditor, and he asked me um, which I would rather have. Would I rather have distribution uniformity or match precipitation? And I mm -hmm. sat there and I thought for a moment, and I said I'd rather have both because you can't have one without the other. They go hand in hand. But you it's my belief that we achieve a higher and better DU percentage with match precipitation. I agree. Corey, so that's, uh, if I can jump in here, that's uh, a great point. And uh, as you said, there are a number of ways that we can achieve match precipitation with rotors uh, by and large with spray heads, the nozzles are match precipitation from the factory. So we Correct. don't have to mess with that. But yeah, a number of ways we can achieve match precipitation rate with rotors. And that is one of many things that factors into the efficiency uh, and the distribution uniformity of an irrigation system. And in uh, a little later on in this program, we're gonna be talking about some of the other things that can also uh, have an effect on your uh, distribution uniformity. Yeah, so I like to just start with the foundation of design. That's why this conversation came first, right? Because I was always taught about head-to-head -head coverage and matched precipitation rate, that distribution uniformity number really being um, all about applying a nice, here we go, a nice even blanket of water so that uh, as so that every part of a station requires the same runtime, okay? So it's really all about running everything the same amount of time and getting everything the same amount of water in that time. Uh, and so 
my concept is a night, I say it over and over again, nice, even distribution blanket of water. So 10 minutes gets every spot about the same amount of water. Now, if you don't achieve that, this is what that looks like. And I reference the place that I stole these slides from uh, later in the presentation, but definitely a, a worthy watch in this conversation. Um, but the point is, if this area right here receives less water, right, you can see the water table after irrigation. This doesn't reflect good a nice even blanket of water. Uh, you're getting more in some places and less in others. And right here we see underwatering happen. So as a smart irrigation manager, I need to set the entire schedule for this entire station to the limited efficiency or precip or whatever's happening right here to the thirstiest spot, right? I have to set the whole schedule uh, to this one thirsty spot and all of this water is wasted water, right? If it's underneath that root depth, it's water that we didn't need to lay down. So we are costing ourselves valuable gallons um, when we are overwatering to compensate for inefficiency. Um, and so I am going to pass this back to Doug because I know he has something to build on that. Oh, absolutely. Um... When we conduct an irrigation audit and we come up with a, a DU, the most common way of, uh, of calculating uh, DU is with something called a distribution uniformity low quarter or a DLLQ. And so essentially what we're trying to find are the driest 25% of the areas in that uh, landscape. And then as Ben said, we have to figure out how to water to that. So for example, uh, if the precipitation rate is a, a, a quarter of an inch in a day, then ideally we wanna have a quarter of an inch be applied all across the uh, turf grass area so that it's all getting the same amount of water. That however would imply that the irrigation system is 100% efficient uh, and there is no sprinkler system that is 100% efficient. So as a result, as Ben has uh, insinuated so far, we have to overwater uh, some of the areas to make sure that we get that minimum amount of water that the turf grass requires to replenish what was lost to ET. And so when we establish what our uh, distribution uh, uniformity is, the next step in programming that information into a controller is to use something called a scheduling multiplier. And, and uh, that says, essentially, we have to take uh, the runtime that we think we should be using, but because of the inefficiency of the sprinkler system, we have to multiply it by a factor based on the distribution uniformity to make sure that all of the areas get that minimum amount of water that they need. And in this case, we said 0.25 inches. But as a result, we're uh, in some cases, based on the inefficiency of these sprinkler equipment, we're grossly overwatering other areas. The higher the distribution uniformity, the lower the scheduling multiplier. So that's in a nutshell why we wanna get our sprinkler systems to be as, uh, as at, with the best distribution uniformity and the best efficiency that we possibly can. Love it, I love it. Corey, anything to add? Uh, <clears throat> you know, I just came across a, a video this morning of a guy putting in Toro T5s and he said, the reason they put them in is because the nozzles that come in them have an 82% distribution efficiency. And that's kind of interesting to me. So I send out a question asking if he's match precipping the zones that he's putting those in, or are they the same nozzle no matter what arc they're throwing? That, so I, I got a little bit of research to do on those. Yeah, for sure. Well, like, and you got to be careful when you're reading this literature because those uh, the those words are so potent, right? <laughs> they get used in a number of different ways, and you just have to kind of uh, navigate your way through and and kind of discern what they're actually talking about. I think. Yeah. Um. All right. Awesome. So I'm gonna go back here. 
we're going to share this and we're going to move on. So uh, now that we have kind of uh, talked about distribution uniformity, what I want to talk about is the difference between the concept of DU, which is really the buzzword in irrigation, and the difference between distribution uniformity and efficiency, which is the setting that we see in WeatherTrack. And that it was uh, something that I kind of struggled with. I couldn't define uh, very well. Like I just kind of stumbled around a definition. So I went out and looked and found this awesome article, which I reference later, so you, you can have it. Um, but uh, Melissa Baumhaley uh, had succinctly said that efficiency refers to how much water we are applying to the plants, while distribution uniformity talks about the system itself, right? The distribution uniformity is that nice, even blanket of water. The, effic or the efficiency goes beyond that and talks about the plant uptake and how that water actually gets down into the root zone. Is that, am I reading that right, Doug? Yes. And would you have anything to build on Melissa's definition of that? No, other than, uh, again, uh, we tend to use uh, the terms, uh, and, and I'm guilty of this as well. So it's something that I've learned just in preparing uh, for our presentation today, uh, we, we tend to use the terms distribution uniformity and sprinkler efficiency interchangeably. And so, for example, I've always said that uh, distribution uniformity is a measure of how efficient uh, the sprinkler system is. And I think to a certain extent, that's part of it. Uh, but a lot of it would have to do with the soil type, for example, and, and how is the water getting down into the root zone through the soil type. So I, I think, uh, again, it's something that I've learned. I need to look, be a little more careful about how I talk about uh, distribution uniformity and sprinkler efficiency. I agree. And I understand that uh, the, the numbers aren't an exact correlation either. Do you know anything about that? So the uh, numbers that you get from a distribution uniformity or a catch can test uh, don't yes. necessarily equate to the same efficiency numbers in the irrigation schedule. Is that correct? Well, uh, that's an area that I need to learn more about because in the past when I've programmed uh, weather track controllers and you program in the variables like what type of irrigation equipment are you using, um, it, it's going to give you a, a default uh, precipitation rate, which you have the ability to change, but apparently it's coming up with a calculation based on the information you're putting in the scheduling efficient for that sprinkler efficiency category. And in the past, I would have put the DU in there, and I'm not sure that's the right thing. So again, learning experience for me on the podcast today. And that, that is exactly kind of what I'm going after, right? Those DU numbers where you said 50% uh, is the standard, 50% uh, is actually the minimum of what the IA will accept if they're testing out a system. Uh, and you never get to 100%. But I do see um, the guys that program in the distribution uniformity numbers end up needing to bump them up a little bit, right? Like just experience tells me that there's something about the difference between the distribution uniformity number and the efficiency number that might not exactly correlate. Right. And I so can see that. That's, that is exactly why we're having this whole conversation today to kind of uh, get to the bottom of and see what we can figure out. All right. So back to the slideshow. Back to this. Here we go. So uh, I think that distribution uniformity talks about the hardware of the system and uh, the efficiency talks about the uptake into the plant, that what's happening below the plant, right? Are we getting a nice even uh, application into the root zone based on the variations of soil type and slope and other things that play into uh, not just the blanket of water being laid down, but the absorption into the plant later on. 
Um, so I leaned back on this slide just to make that point. Um, and again, this is all about that efficiency number. Now, with WeatherTrack, you would be uh, over here uh, tar adjusting stations using the percent adjust as your first line of defense. If you're following the best practice, right? You need a little bit more or a little bit less water out of your weather track system. Uh, you use this percent adjust uh, until that percent adjust isn't enough. And that's when I think it's a problem with generally your sprinkler efficiency. Generally, if you get plus 25 and you're still not getting the right amount of irrigation, uh, then there's something tragically wrong with this dis or this efficiency number, right? We're not having good design. We're not getting a nice even blanket of water. Uh, and that's when I see things start to stress and start to go the, the other way. So if you're nerding out with me at home, uh, stick with percent adjust until you get to either extreme. And then uh, the only other two settings that will adjust the total runtime for a station are your precip rate and your efficiency. Those are the ones that drive that end number of how many minutes do we need to apply. Okay. So now we get to the real world stuff, right? We started with design. We started with the concept stuff. But what I want to get into is in the real world, again, if I lean back on that conversation about training, I say it's about the design, the installation, and the long-term maintenance. And that long-term maintenance really is the, the, the heart of the matter in my experience, because uh, sprinkler guys are notorious for putting whatever nozzle on the head that they have. Uh, they put whatever nozzle they have on their truck if they need to replace it, right? Especially with those rotor heads, it does make a big difference. Um, and, and we wanna talk about as a smart water manager, what are the things that we look at? So uh, I wanna just, start remember that we do have slides and we'll look at specifics um, but i want to start with just a quick conversation about that um i'll start with you corey um when you are talking about that nice even blanket of water we look at design and install but how often do you see the maintenance practice affecting that uh every day um, like you said, irrigation techs are known just to put whatever nozzle they have in their truck just to just to put in the rotor. But they don't understand. I'm not sure they understand how that changes the hydraulics of the system or the hydraulics of that particular zone. Um, you know, in weather track lingo, that could make it a low flow zone. That could make it a high flow zone um, and cause it to alert and maybe suffer the grass to suffer. Um, so it's important, I think, to go back to a head on each side and figure out to see if those nozzles are the same or if they're different and figure out how to make it how to make it the same for our best match match precipitation purposes and water application. I totally agree. And Doug, any high <laughs> high level lessons before we delve into the specifics? Um, let's delve. Oh, let's delve. I'm in for it. So let me go back to the screen and we will now look at some very specific examples of things happening out in the field uh, that were caught on what I would call a site assessment rather than an audit. When in my brain, audit means catch can test. Assessment means go look at all of the, the smart water stuff, right? Look at the station uh, without the scientific measurement of it. Um, so I don't, again, interchangeable. Those are things that we need to determine as an industry, how to, how to use those words properly, because a lot of people call a lot of different things <laughs> a side audit. Um, so here we have, Doug, can you tell me what I'm seeing here? Yes. Um, when I visit properties and I visit a lot of properties and over the years, I've seen a lot of interesting things. And some of them, you just kind of stand there and, and uh, shake your head. And uh, most of these pictures I'm going to show you are from uh, one particular property in Fountain Hills. Um, 
but the first thing I want to do is uh, a site assessment or an inspection of the irrigation equipment, just looking for obvious things that are going to have a, a negative impact on uh, the efficiency of the irrigation system. So, for example, uh, and if I can pick on you, Corey, uh, what what do you see wrong with this uh, piece of irrigation equipment that we're showing right now? Well, it's a van nozzle one, and it's adjusted to spray. It's spraying on the sidewalk from what I can see in the picture. It looks like it's spraying almost a 360. Uh, correct. And uh, I want you to look at what the sidewalk looks like, because not only are we uh, watering something that we don't fertilize or mow or harvest, uh, we're wasting uh, a lot of water, not, you know, just watering the grass, but we're also causing premature wear to the uh, uh, equipment there, the sidewalk, the hardscape. Okay, uh, you can go to. The oh, next wait, slide, I have. Uh, since you brought that up, I have to tell you uh, one of my big uh, apartment complexes that is doing a weather track rollout. Uh, we were talking about water savings and the maintenance guys would not get off the point that their uh -huh. parking lots were dry, right? They didn't care that the, the walk, grass was getting the right amount. What they saw was uh, there weren't any cattails on at the bottom of the lot. What they said, though, that we went back and talked to them five years later, they said that um, they under the old management system, they were replacing those parking lots every two years be and they didn't realize that it was because of the wear and tear of the water oh. every night hitting those parking lots. But since weather track had been installed and smart water management principles yeah. had been applied, they hadn't had to replace that parking lot even once in the five years that, uh, that we had been running that. And so it's just evidence that when we talk about water savings being the only right. return on this investment, the wear and tear on the on the site and the hardware on site is a hugely underestimated and under talked about conversation in this. OK, that was nerdy. I know. I'm sorry. Going back. I'm going to show the next slide, Doug. Here we go. Do the, my question Rapid is, fail. do they all have. The okay. hand of Doug Donahue in the corner. <laughs> Just kidding. What do you uh, see here, Doug? Possibly. <laughs> okay. Um, I am having a little trouble seeing the pictures right now. Okay, um, so I what I'm seeing is another band nozzle resource. shaved off in blah, the corner. Blah, blah. Okay, here we are. I'm back. Okay. Right. Corey, what do you see? Uh, tell me at least two this picture. Um, the, the van nozzle is, looks like it's been cut off by a mower or something. And then it looks like it might be leaking out the stem or around the stem as well. Okay. So, so Corey, um, yeah, two things, uh, that jump out at me with this picture that was taken during a site assessment. One is the broken nozzle, which is easily resolved. Uh, the other is uh, something that maybe not a lot of people are aware of, uh, which is a, a leaky wiper seal. And that's the water that you see bubbling around the base of the stem. And uh, that is because after a period of years, the wiper seal is subject to UV degradation and the, the soft rubber uh, cracks and gives way and causes a leak there which again is just uh, wasting water and stealing uh, water and pressure from the other sprinkler heads. Absolutely. You can see that coming right up from the bottom. Sure enough. Doug, do you see that? I think we might've lost Doug. <clears throat> ben, I've lost you if you can hear me. Okay. Um, maybe if you turn off your camera, you can, we can still hear you and you can still participate. Can you try and turn off your camera and talk to me? Yeah, let's give that a try. Oh, I hear you just fine now. You want to oh, good. try and present this slide for me? Sure. Corey, what are you seeing here? Um, That looks like it's a completely busted head that's just leaking out water. Yeah, I'm guessing 
uh, maybe this is all the same zone. So it could be low pressure causing that, but um, something is happening to this head that isn't, you're not getting the full spray pattern, right? You're only getting a drizzle out of the, the top of this nozzle. Um, and so this speaks to a, a larger problem, a maintenance problem, either uh, the head is blocked somehow, or there's something on this system that is affecting the pressure uh, that is just, it's got, it doesn't even look like it's popped up all the way. It looks like it, it might just be uh, half the way up and barely spitting out water. Well, another common problem that we see uh, on properties where there is elevation change, uh, this is what's called low head drainage. And this is where you have a zone uh, that has sprinklers at the bottom of a slope. And when the valve shuts off, all of the water in the pipe uh, leaks out of the low heads. And um, Sometimes if there's enough elevation change and enough pressure in the line, the heads will actually stay popped up for a little bit. So uh, this is one that's at the bottom of the slope. And like I say, all the water in the piping system is, is leaking out. And what, what's gonna happen the next time the uh, zone goes to irrigate is the first thing that has to happen is it has to fill up the pipe again. And that subjects the pipe and the sprinkler equipment to water hammer and surge pressure. And uh, there's a, a feature that I hope most of you know about called cycle and soak. And cycle and soak is aimed at uh, slopes with tight clay soils, with sprinkler heads that are irrigating with high precipitation rates. And in that case, we want to take the total runtime and divide it into shorter uh, cycles with some soak time in between each. Well, if you have low head drainage, now not only are we allowing all of that water to leak out once, subjecting the sprinkler equipment to water hammer and surge pressure when the line refills, it's, it's leaking out multiple times because of using cycle and soak. So we have a very simple uh, solution for this uh, problem, and that's to uh, replace that sprinkler head or at least the internal with one that has a SAM uh, check valve feature in it. And that will hold the water in the piping. Yeah, Corey, so we were right. It, it's a pressure problem, but not due to a break. That valve isn't on. So what we said was right. It just wasn't exactly the right conditions. Good job. <laughs> and again, that SAM head, which are uh, <clears throat> legislated into uh, or are mandated by some water districts now, uh, we're seeing those become more and more um, of a requirement of design is something that we see more commonly. Ah, uh, Corey, grow this picture. This is an easy one. It looked like it's clogged nozzle. One, the spray pattern's not not watering everything evenly i agree looks like we're watering a lot of gravel looks like rocks i don't think those rocks are going to grow and <laughs> this is a very common thing right landscapes always change uh and there's projects that eliminate turf and uh, maybe uh they have eliminated the turf here but they haven't eliminated the turf irrigation here right they uh are running a system on a they're wasting a ton of water uh, because of the distribution that they have chosen uh, to water whatever live plants are in here, which aren't pictured in the in the photo that Doug gave us. So um, a lot of water being wasted here, things that uh, would not just do affect your distribution uniformity, but inefficient irrigation. All right, Doug. So... Uh, <laughs> I love this one. Uh, this is where a turf conversion was done. And uh, yet they wound up leaving this one particular spray head in place. Uh, so every time uh, that particular zone comes on, this spray head pops up and waters nothing. So again, two for, what is that? Four for four? Corey and I are nailing it today. Again, it's amazing when you're when you're walking a property, uh, the, the types of things that you see like this, where you just kind of 
scratch your head and go, what was somebody thinking that they didn't, you know, cap this one off? Yeah, I see it a lot. This is a, another slam dunk, Corey. I know you're going to see this right off the bat, but I love this conversation. This drives me nuts. Yeah, look, doesn't look like the sidewalks turning green again. Nope. Nope. What else do you see? Uh... So what I see, maybe your screen is not catching it, but I see yeah. a mix of spray heads and rotor heads on the same station, right? So up here I've got oh, okay. spray heads, down. Yep. and down yep. here I've got a rotor head running. And yep. okay, sorry, I had to I had to uh, scroll back in to see that. All right, what do we have here, Mister Donahue? We're back to our uh, property in Fountain Hills, um, gated community. Uh, and uh, although it's a little hard to tell on this particular zone, we have rotors and spray heads combined. Like we were talking about, the spray head distribution rate and the rotor head distribution rate are entirely different, right? Uh, you've got a fixed spray going into your field of irrigation uh, and, and spray heads need half or less of the runtime that your average rotor will need. And yeah. so when you get these mixed zones where you've got multiple different kinds of heads, again, we have to water the entire station to the rotor runtime, right? To keep all of this grass green, we've got to give it a rotor runtime, which is double that of what we need out of the spray heads. So pit Which is going to most likely drown the pop-up area. Right, exactly. And even if it doesn't affect the plant health, it definitely affects the water bill, right? This isn't smart yeah. water management. And in another slide or two, we're going to look at an example of uh, match precipitation uh, gone, gone bad. But in this particular case, we have rotors and spray heads on the same zone. And the one rotor uh, at the bottom of the picture is set to water across the sidewalk. And if you really spend some time looking at this picture, you can see how badly the sidewalk is stained from being irrigated over a long period of time. Yeah, you can. You can definitely see that white line, that like chalk line coming down the spray radius of the, the rotor head. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that's funny uh all right Corey. <clears throat> i think doug is, is taking a very clear picture here uh we don't see any heads but what do we see looks like a lot of misting a lot of evaporation yeah that's what i see too absolutely i see um this to me speaks of a pressure problem um yes. and tell me how uh how you would manage this, right? First of all, what are you seeing? And second of all, what would you do about it? Um, just seeing a lot of water that that's just uh, evaporating and, and being blown away by wind or the sun, uh, being swallowed up by the sun. And then, you know, you manage it by either putting pressure reducing swing arms or pressure reducing heads on the zone. Yeah, those check valve heads, the SAM PRS uh, if you're using Rainbird's pop-ups, they're called SAM PRS, and they've got a check valve in them that is pressure regulating to the optimum pressure that it takes to manage both their normal nozzles and their smart nozzles. Yeah. Um, and with an overpressurized system, we get what we call atomization, right? And there, there's so much pressure pushing that water out that it makes the tiny water droplets that never fall where they're supposed to, right? So our the principle is the big water droplets are easy to control and we can effectively put them where we want them. But once they atomize, the wind takes them and and the, they never really land in our effective irrigation area. So it's water that's essentially lost. And uh, this significantly affects our efficiency. They also make um, pressure regulated rotors now in the I-20s and the 5000s. And there's pressure regulation before the backflow if needed or at the valve if needed. But I am a big fan of having it right there at the head. Yes. Well, uh, this picture and then the next one I have in here to show um, 
what you're going to see uh, when you're uh, visiting a property and you run into high pressure. Um, I usually look, uh, you know, generally speaking, I'm doing an assessment of the whole system, but then I kind of dial in on three specific things, pressure, nozzles, and smart controllers. And we're going to talk about those for the rest of the uh, presentation this, uh, today. Uh, this picture is an indication of the small water droplets that exist when you have uh, high pressure, uh, particularly with a spray head system. And in that case, you're typically using more water, but less efficiently uh, because those small water droplets are susceptible to evaporation and drift. Uh, go ahead and go to the next picture, Ben. Okay. Uh, I like this one because typically uh, a symptom of high pressure and those small water droplets is you see a rainbow. And uh, so that's a, another indication that you might be dealing with high pressure. Uh, I have uh, done a study that shows that at higher operating pressures, uh, a half sprinkler head, a 15 foot half sprinkler head takes as much as a gallon per minute more than a sprinkler head operating at the correct pressure. And if you start to crunch the numbers and you think, well, I don't have one sprinkler head, I have X amount. And then you think, well, they're not running for one minute, they're running for 10 or 15 minutes. And then you multiply that by the uh, number of uh, times you irrigate a year. Uh, and in Arizona, with the overseeding that we do, it might be as many as 300 uh, times per year. And one zone with 30 sprinkler heads can be using as much as 90,000 gallons a minute more than a zone that has heads that are pressure regulating. Wow. Uh, and you talked uh, earlier about um, mandates in uh, several states. I think we're up to about nine states now where it's a requirement that you put in pressure regulating uh, spray head bodies. And that really makes sense where we come from because the variation in slope that we see in Denver, like we're a mountain range community, right? We're right next to the uh -huh. mountains. So there is significant slope that we encounter on almost every site. So that low head drainage that you were talking about before is really, really an issue. Right. Low head and drainage I'm, and, I'm and like, pressure are a couple sorry, things go ahead. I'm going to be looking for. Yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, uh, I thought you were just, this was your silent plug to Pride Week like the, or Pride Month. Isn't this Pride <laughs> Month? I thought this was your rainbow, just as a, a subtle nod. No? I believe it is Pride Month. <laughs> are you ready for the next one? Uh. Let me speak before we go to the next one about a couple of other things that I'm looking for. I mentioned just a little bit ago after I uh, evaluate the pressure um, and, and try to make sure that we get that under control before we go any further. The next couple of things that I'm looking for are uh, nozzles. And in particular, if they have a lot of spray heads on the property, are they using what are called high efficiency nozzles uh, that have almost twice the distribution uniformity, in some cases, just by changing the nozzle. Very short ROI on that um, project. And something that a lot of people just don't understand uh, when using rotors is the concept of match precipitation rate uh, nozzles with rotors. And as we talked about earlier in the call, there's a couple different ways that we can achieve that. But a couple of the manufacturers now have match precipitation rate nozzles for their rotors. So uh, those are the next couple of things I'm, I'm looking at. And uh, I think you can go ahead and go to the next slide. Okay. It uh, looks like we could just tighten up the, the arc a little bit. looks like we're still watering over on the sidewalk a bunch in some areas. Yep. And again, I see a, a maxi paw on one corner and spray heads for the rest of the zone. So, yeah. and it and it looks to me like it's a distance problem. It looks like they tried to, they were missing sprinkler heads because of whatever box that is. And then they tried to cover the gap with a larger head uh, and caused all, I'm sure, all sorts of disruption in the distribution uniformity. 
So uh, can you go to the next slide, please? Certainly. All right, so you, you see here three rainbird sprinklers, three Toro sprinklers and three hunter sprinklers. Uh, this was just one side of the zone along the sidewalk. And there were one or more of each of these types of sprinklers uh, on that particular zone. So uh, if you go ahead and populate the rest of the information, uh, what I did is I looked in the manufacturer's catalog and I looked at the ideal operating pressure for each of these uh, sprinklers to see what the precipitation rate is. And you'll see as Ben is uh, populating those precipitation rates that they range between uh, 0.38 inches per hour, which is a very low precipitation rate, to 1.93 inches per hour. Uh, I like to... Um, relate that to the monsoon storms that we have in Arizona. And if you look out the window and you see rain coming down at 1.93 inches per hour, uh, what are you gonna be seeing out there? And you're gonna see flooding. Uh, and that's how quickly uh, this particular sprinkler head is applying water. It's applying water about five times the rate of the sprinkler head with the uh, precipitation rate of 0.38 inches per hour. So we have all these different sprinkler heads all applying water at a different rate. And it begs the question, how do you program the controller? Right, and if the we answer go back is to that slide that we had before, and we go way back here to this conversation, right? Right. And, right. and think of what that looks like in the ground. if. One sprinkler head is delivering five times as much water as one on the same zone, and we have to deliver enough irrigation with the slow zone to get to the bottom of the root depth. Think of how deep this watering is and how much water we're wasting on those heavily watered parts of the station. Yeah, and I'm all about figuring out a way to tweak sprinkler systems for customers and say, hey, you could make a, a significant improvement if you would just change the high efficiency nozzles. There is no tweak for uh, this system that we just looked at. It would have to be uh, completely redone to achieve the concept of match precipitation nozzles to even have a chance of having efficient irrigation. And really, so, uh, oh, go ahead. Uh, there's a couple of sayings that I use when I teach. One is an idiot of a sprinkler system plus a smart controller equals, and the answer is an idiot of a sprinkler system. Because unless the system is hydraulically sound, uh, the controller's not really gonna be able to make much of an improvement. And I always, as I, as I explained my process of uh, being on a property and looking at uh, the system evaluation, the pressure, the nozzles, and then does a smart controller make sense? I've always kind of thought that we need to go through that process and get the system hydraulically sound before we look at the smart controller. But over the last couple of years, I've kind of softened my thought process a little bit because I realized what a great diagnostic tool the smart controllers are. And they're going to help you find uh, flow problems and electrical problems you didn't even know you had. For sure. And I would uh, I work for a smart controller company, so obviously I have a, a slightly different view of that. But I, I agree that uh, to save the most water we need a combination of the two, right? If we are looking to maximize the water conservation and the sprinkler efficiency, it takes more than just the right control product to do that. It definitely, uh, <clears throat> to, to lay down the right amount by station, a, a good design, a sound efficient design is an instrumental part of that. And with a sound design, we can increase our water savings by two, three times. Like in this example, you have one section of the landscape that's using five times more water than it needs uh, because of the way that it's nozzled, because of this distribution uniformity. So right. uh, I agree. I, I'm on the bandwagon that says that uh, data helps us manage. You can't manage what you don't measure. And, and seeing this all in action um, helps us 
to orchestrate a plan and, and strategize what steps need to be taken. And really all we're arguing is what needs to happen first, right? <laughs> uh, we both agree that uh, a sound irrigation design and uh, efficient irrigation field system combined with a smart controller is the best way to save water, right? Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, I would say something along the lines of uh, a smart controller plus a hydraulically sound irrigation system equals, and that's a question, and the answer is three. And you might say, well, how did you come up with that? Well, it's kind of like the old saying, one plus one equals three. If you have the hydraulically sound irrigation system and the smart controller, you've got the best of both worlds. I'll take it. And the, and the one thing that I was going to say is as a nerdy irrigation guy, as a water manager, if I wanted to go into the world and sell water management services, this is the kind of stuff that I am focused on. Absolutely. Because the, the addition of smart controllers is, in my eyes, just the first step. With the addition of the data, we start to analyze that system, the uh, uniformity of the system and the efficiency of the field components, as well as other variables that we are in control of, what we're watering and when we're watering and all of those things that a, a good water manager can tweak and harness and make sure that we are doing right by uh, the the entire site and um the customer is willing to pay for those type of upgrades, right? If we can convince our customer that a better design will save them five times as much water, then once they're in the water saving business, they're already halfway there, right? We just, we have a bunch of billable water management tasks that we can take to market and build an entire business saving people water and selling things that people want to buy. Well, and Ben, I so appreciate you doing this uh, session uh, today because I think a lot of uh, even uh, people that have been in the irrigation industry for for a long time uh, don't understand the science behind what makes an irrigation system efficient. And so I really appreciate the fact that we've had an opportunity to together with Corey today to discuss those things that help to increase um, sprinkler efficiency and distribution uniformity. Uh, before we close out, I want to give you a chance to read the resource materials. Let me tell you how much I had to study to get this conversation done. Um, <clears throat> Doug Donahue, I want to give you a shout out, not as a guest, but as a resource material. Uh, when I started logging the things that I used as resources for this conversation, uh, that picture that I took of you led me to this smart irrigation tips for drought conditions in which you talk about all of these things right up front, right? It's an amazing series that you and Ewing are doing. Can you talk about that a little bit? Sure. Um, we have uh, a, a great resource uh, available to us at Ewing in our videographer. His name is Kyle Ellsworth. And many of us at Ewing have had the opportunity to work with Kyle in doing um videos on products that we sell and i'm specifically involved with ones that help uh, with irrigation efficiency uh, all kinds of different uh, products that we have available uh, to increase uh, irrigation efficiency and all of those videos are posted on youtube uh, ewing has a youtube channel uh, and if you just uh, search for that uh, ewing uh, ewing videos you'll be able to see a lot of the different ones that we've done uh, specifically on water efficiency, but on a lot of the other products we sell as well. I love it. And I use it as a resource. Absolutely. I, I think that uh, distributors have an amazing investment in this ongoing training and this perspective that you guys are bringing to the market. And I think this is as good an example as there is of this type of distributor led training. So good job wow. to you and to your videographer and to whoever else is on that team. Thank you. But on top of that, the, the water distribution slides came from this computation of irrigation efficiencies. It is a fantastic video that I learned a ton from. 
And uh, a great article that really started me down this path is this science of irrigation efficiency versus uniformity, right? That's that quote that I I had before from Melissa Baum Haley. And uh, I would definitely check these out. They are great pieces of this conversation. Um, and then next month, uh, we are in the heat of summer. So I find myself uh, doing a lot of best practice for summer management conversations and uh, individual trainings this type of this time of year. Um, and so I thought it would be a key time to talk about um, if you're already a weather track manager, what are the common things that we see that are unique to the heat of summer, the heat of the peak of the season, right? When every irrigation tech is running at 100 miles an hour, what are the things that uh, the weather track is telling us that can make our job easier, that can highlight system inefficiency or system malfunction? And what are the things that we need to keep an eye on to proactively manage, to dial in the systems even better? So uh, next month, we will be talking about summertime smart controller management. Bless you. Thank you. All right, Corey. Uh, I'm going to go back here. I'm going to stop. Um, Corey, thank you so much for making time. Do you have anything you want to close out with? Any messages? Any shout outs? Mm, weather tracks where it's at. Doug, is there anything else you wanted to say to the crowd before we call it wraps on this session? No, uh, I just appreciate uh, those that are uh, watching today and hopefully reaping the benefit of uh, the training that you've put together today, Ben. I appreciate it very much. I likewise, I appreciate your time and all of the effort that you put into collecting this information and sending me pictures. And, and uh, there was nobody I would rather have this conversation with, Doug. So awesome. Corey, thank you so much for making time. It has been a pleasure. Thank you all for tuning in and watching. Uh, we will see you next time on Smart Water Wednesdays. Thanks, man.